So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I know this is happy hour. I know this is happy hour. If folks can grab your seat or grab a seat. Yes. Yep, absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> we got a few words, you know. Few, gotcha. All right, okay. All right, folks, okay, looks like we got everybody um, in place here. Looks like some of the seating arrangement got taken over by the media. <laughs> wow. Well, we do want to thank the media for coming out. This is a very important day for folks who have been doing this work for quite some time. Um, under the leadership of uh, folks involved with the Connecticut Hospital Violence Intervention Program Initiative uh, with the bill that we've been um, supporting, uh, working with our lawmakers, you'll hear more about that, but also the work of um, both Connecticut Against Gun Violence and Moms Demand Action related to the bill that they've been working on. And so we want to thank the governor and others for coming down to uh, be a part of the ceremonial signing. My name is Andrew Woods. I'm the uh, statewide director of the Hospital, Connecticut Hospital Violence Intervention Program Collaborative. I'm also the Executive Director of HCTC, Hartford Communities That Care. My job for the day is to welcome you and to acknowledge our key partners. Though Senator Stratham, Stratham? Stratham. will be introducing advocates and, um, and folks that have worked on HB 6355, you'll be hearing later from State Senator Doug McCrory, Representative Gilcrest, Representative Hall, Executive Director Fatima Lorraine Dreyer of the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention about our bill, of which both uh, Speaker Ritter, who um, sends his regrets, were able to help us get through uh, both the House and the Senate. In December of 2019, we established the Connecticut HVIP uh, Collaborative right here in this room with the aim of elevating and supporting the work of HVIPs, Hospital Violence Intervention Programs. We have prepared some detailed handouts on the back uh, for your reading, which can be found on the back table. So for now, I want to acknowledge some of our key partners, starting with civic leaders, two of which is both Steve Harris and also uh, Brother Carl Harder. Can you just give it up for both those individuals? <laughs> These are both folks who have, for years, been on the front lines with us working both as interventionists as well as advocates for these kind of services. I also want to recognize the philanthropic leadership of Jay Williams from the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, Tiffany Donaldson from the Connecticut Health Foundation, and Joanne Price of Fairview Capital. I also want to now also recognize our frontline provider organizations based out of Hartford, Compass Youth Collaborative, Blue Hill Civic Association, Mothers United Against Violence, and the Wilson Gray YMCA. And now I also want to recognize our executive leadership team that has actually worked behind the scenes with our lawmakers to get HB 5677 across the finish line. And these are Ebony, Ebony Epps from Street Safe Bridgeport. <laughs> In fact, I, I, put that, I put that pause there. Hold off on your, your claps uh, because you'll be clapping for a while. Uh, Leonard Jihad out of Connecticut Violence Intervention Program. Dr. James Doddington of Yale New Haven Hospital, Carl Shipso from the Connecticut Hospital Association, Dr. David Shapiro from St. Francis Hospital, Dr. Jonathan Gates of Hartford Hospital, Kevin Burrup of Connecticut Children's Medical Center, Fatima Lorraine Dreyer and Kyle Fisher from the Javi Health Alliance for Violence Intervention, Mike McLively from the Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, Krista Green, two of our former members, but still active members, both Krista Green, formerly of the Connecticut Children's Medical Center, and Dr. Steve Wolf, formerly of St. Francis Hospital. Uh, at this time, I also want to acknowledge two of my uh, wing persons, and that is Joanna Schubert and Ken Ashworth, who work with me on the administrative side as well as on the communication side um, to, uh, to help keep some of the glue together with the collaborative. And now I want to put out a special thanks to our, la our lawmakers. Uh, principally Senator Doug McCrory, Speaker Matt Ritter, Representative Gilcrest, Representative Hall, working with our coalition to introduce this bill and getting it to the governor's desk for signing, and therefore a big thanks to the governor for now being the first in the nation to sign this historical legislation into law. 
And so now I turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Susan Bicevich. Thank you so much, Andrew, and uh, it is great to be here with all of you to celebrate this successful legislation. Gun violence comes in many forms, and we must do everything we can to address this issue at its core. Whether violence happens in a city, a suburb, in a workplace, or in a home, all of it is tragic, all of it is wrong, and we can prevent it. These bills represent the state's broad and diverse commitment to our communities. In allowing Medicaid to reimburse for some services, it provides financial security and predictability for groups like Communities That Care, allowing them to work with more people in more neighborhoods. And in strengthening our red flag law, we help to prevent further violence for victims of abuse and assault at home. Governor Lamont, by signing these bills today, demonstrates once again how committed our administration is to common sense gun reforms with the goal of keeping as many people safe and are out of harm's way as possible. We've got a lot of speakers, um, and uh, we're going to ask each of them uh, to be as brief as they can be. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce Mayor Luke Cronin. Mayor. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz. Thank you, Andrew, and the entire team at Hartford Communities That Care uh, for your work and leadership and also for hosting us today. Uh, and thanks to all of the uh, folks who are out there every single day working in our community here in Hartford and in communities across the state to try to save lives, stop gun violence, and make our community safer. Uh, Governor, thank you for your commitment to keeping Connecticut a national leader in common sense gun laws. Uh, you know, Connecticut 20 years ago took the lead in red flag laws, and thanks to the leadership of the legislators here and you, Governor, uh, we can now say that we're a leader again. Um, I know that Representative Staffstrom is going to talk more detail about those bills, but those red flag laws updated save lives. They ensure that people who pose a threat to others uh, cannot have a gun. Uh, but I wanted to place special emphasis in, uh, on the second piece of this, which is the reimbursement for uh, violence intervention efforts. Um, we often talk about the fact that gun violence needs to be treated as a public health issue, as a public health crisis. Uh, with the signing of this bill, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We're saying that uh, this needs to be treated and reimbursed as health care prevention. Because we know that one of the biggest predictors of future involvement in gun violence, whether as a victim or as a perpetrator, is having been a victim of violence in the past. And so that opportunity in that hospital, following up from that wound, is one of the best opportunities, much like intervening in addiction, it's one of the best opportunities to break the cycle of violence, to help provide the care that is needed over the long term in a meaningful way. And being able to treat this like a health care issue and get that reimbursement makes a huge difference. So I want to just echo the thanks that has been said before uh, to, uh, to all of our legislators, uh, but I want to say a special thanks to our Hartford delegation who took an active leadership role in this work. Uh, Senator McCrory, thank you for your tremendous leadership on this and, and uh, tenacity. Representative Hall, thank you to all of our delegation who couldn't be here, including Speaker Ritter. Um, really, really grateful for our team in Hartford pulling together and pushing uh, this important issue forward. Uh, and to everybody else who does this work, help get these bills over this finish line. And again, Governor, to you and your entire team for making this a priority uh, and making sure that we're putting our money where our mouth is. Thank you all. Mayor, thank you so much. It is now my pleasure to bring up uh, our Commissioner of Public Safety, James Ravella. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Well, it feels like I'm coming home. 
Um, but I hate to come home on such bleak circumstances. Um, congratulations, Senator, representatives, uh, for your great work. Um, put another tool in the toolbox to pre for prevention. But ladies and gentlemen, when I, when I came off, uh, when I walked in the door, somebody t told me these are unprecedented times. And I spoke to Steve Harris, Reverend Brown, Andrew Woods, and these are not unprecedented times for us. In the 80s and the 90s, we had the same problem. Um, and we're going to live through this, and we're going to make it right again. Uh, for our cities and for our suburbs, we're going to make it right. There's no doubt about that. Last week, um, I gathered with some chiefs, and we talked about uh, reasonable measures. And um, thank you to the governor and OPM for um, giving us a, um, a shot in the arm. It is not only just law enforcement, it's about the bigger picture, the cooperative effort. And this is what's different than the 80s and 90s, folks. You know, when you bring together folks like um, the Bridgeport Safe Streets, or Hartford Communities that Care, Peace Builders, Mothers Against Violence, our faith-based groups, Bishop Curry, um, the Coalition of Gun, Gun Violence. We bring all these people in with our hospitals and the public health epidemic, our community groups, our legislators. We are going to make a difference in this, whether it's juvenile crime or whether it's uh, violence. But I can't forget to mention our law enforcement. Let's reinvest in law enforcement. Let's trust in their work. Um, Governor, you've put on, uh, in my tenure, 200 troopers, right? and you funded us for another um, almost 200 moving forward. Um, that's admirable. Um, we were put in a hole when we first walked through the door, and we're going to dig our way out of that hole, and we're going to participate in everybody's single community around the state. We're going to do the best we can uh, to stem this. But these pieces in our toolbox will now tend towards prevention of violent crime, right? Um, and that's a big part of this. So, um, Senator, Representatives, thank you very much, and Governor, Thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you so much, Commissioner Rivella. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce someone who has been at the forefront of making sure that our state leads in sensible uh, gun safety measures, State Representative Steve Staffstrom. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Governor. Thank, thanks for hosting us here in Hartford. Um, look, coming from the city of Bridgeport, I know all too well the scourge of gun violence and the plague that it has uh, on our streets and on our communities, uh, on our businesses, on our schools, on every facet of um, our, our lives. I'm happy to see Safe Streets here and, and so many um, friends and partners in, in prevention. Uh, as we, we sign uh, what is historic legislation today. Um, I was asked specifically to focus on the bill that came out of the Judiciary Committee, which is uh, the update to the red flag law, HB 6355. You know, as the Lieutenant Governor referenced, Connecticut has long been a leader in uh, the national gun violence prevention movement and passing sensible gun legislation. So we were the first state in the nation back in 1999 uh, following the mass shooting at the Connecticut Lottery to pass a uh, red flag law, also known as a risk warrant or risk protection order. Uh, we were rightly proud at that time to have taken that first stand. But as these decades have gone on, gone on uh, 19 other states in the District, of Connecticut, the District of Columbia have enacted their own laws regarding um, how to get a firearm out of the hands of someone who shouldn't possess one, either because of, um, uh, because of, of situations at home or, or uh, at work or the like. Um, and we needed to update our, our current statute. And the bill that the governor is about to sign represents the most comprehensive update, and I would submit the strongest red flag law in the nation. Um, we are moving away from the system where only two police officers or a state's attorney could apply for uh, a risk warrant, and we're creating a new process whereby individual family members or medical professionals who often have more accurate, timely information uh, can begin the process and apply for a risk protection order uh, and begin an investigation by law enforcement into seizing firearms. Um, we are creating a process whereby someone who 
uh, does not currently possess a firearm, but is maybe going out to get one, or and shouldn't be able to go out to get one, uh, a court can order that they not go out and buy a firearm, that they be put on the, the list not to purchase a firearm. Um, and most particularly, we are removing the current expiration in um, uh, when these orders end. Right now, under current law, someone's firearms are ordered removed from them. Um, a year later, they get them back, no matter what. Uh, we are changing that to allow a petition process for folks to get the firearm back, but not to uh, have them automatically returned. This has real-life consequences. Um, a study by Duke University found that between 1999 and 2013, when the study was conducted, Connecticut's red flag law prevented between 38 and 76 suicides. Um, we know that for each additional uh, risk warrant or um, uh, risk protection order that is applied for, it prevents additional deaths. Uh, and that is what we are doing here today, is very real uh, preventing deaths. I'd be remiss if I didn't um, very quickly just thank uh, certainly uh, my team on the Judiciary Committee, certainly beginning with my co-chair, Senator Winfield, who couldn't be with us today, Vice Chairman, uh, Representative Blumenthal, uh, of course our great staff, Adam Scavera and Zoe Gluck, uh, and of course all the members of the Judiciary Committee, including Representative Gilchrist and, and Representative Hall, who are, who are here with us today. Uh, and also a special thanks to all the advocates, um, certainly Moms Demand Action uh, and every town who have been pushing these updates around the nation, uh, including here in Connecticut and our, our own homegrown uh, Connecticut Against Gun Violence who uh, stood in strong support of this legislation as well. Thank you, Governor. Um, thank you so much, Representative Staffstrom. And uh, I think uh, he is absolutely right that one of the reasons that Connecticut has continued to lead in gun safety measures is because of the grassroots advocacy that has happened in our state. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce Jeremy Stein, the Executive Director of Connecticut Against Gun Violence. Jeremy. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I just want to start off by um, thanking Andrew Woods for hosting this and for all the work that you do and for your constant voice in making sure that we are focusing on the right issues at the right time. Um, I want to thank um, the governor for signing all of these bills into law for being a champion on this issue. Lieutenant Governor, Speaker Ritter, Majority Leader Rojas, uh, Senate President Looney, Senate Majority Leader Bob Duff, uh, the Vice Chairs, Senator Gary Winfield, and especially Steve Strafstrom. Without, with this and other bills, would never see the light of day. Um, and as a result, Connecticut is a true leader on this issue. So thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, but I also want to thank my tireless team, Jonathan Perlow, Tara Volpe, Janet Woods, Joni Lowe, uh, all the interns and supporters, my entire board, Melissa Kane is here. Um, and Gloria Norwick couldn't be here, but mostly I want to thank, thank the supporters who are in this room right now, all the people in the back of the room who do this work a lot of times when we're sleeping. Um, and so I want to thank you for being the advocates that do this day in, day out. I see all the familiar faces, Reverend Brown, um, uh, Ebony, um, jihad. I mean, this is the real work that we need to be doing because we know that while Connecticut has the sixth lowest gun death rate in the nation, it's unacceptably high and, and affects communities of color disproportionately. Um, I also want to point attention to Jen Lawler and Joanne Kirsten, who are survivors in this, who, who really make this, uh, uh, this the reason why we, we needed to extend this law and to strengthen this as well. And we look forward to continuing to work with the governor's office to try to um, finally end gun violence, to try to get additional funding to help our communities. We're proud to be a partner on the advisory committee that was also created at, um, as part of SB1. We look forward to trying to create a commission uh, on prevention and intervention along with many of the partners in the room, the hobby, with Fatima and Kyle and Andrew and, uh, and many of the other partners and hospitals here. Um, as Steve said, you know, while community violence is the pandemic that's going on right 
Here it needs to be solved. The other form of gun violence more prevalent than community gun violence is suicide. It's two-thirds of all gun violence. Take any of the, of the homicides in any month, and pretty much you can double that, and that's the number of suicides that is happening um, in Connecticut and around the country. Um, it is something that we need to reduce. Um, and although, although this law was originally enacted to prevent another mass shooting, it's really a tool for suicide prevention. And what does this law do? What is it going to do? Well, it's going to reach a lot of people. It's going to prevent suicides. It's going to intervene. It's going to provide safe periods for cooling down periods. And it's going to save lives by shifting suicide attempt methods from firearms to less lethal means. Um, we know this law works. We do. Studies show that when we implemented this, there was an over 13% reduction in suicide. We know the law is effective. And most importantly for me, this is something very personal to me, my uncle David Stein killed himself with a firearm. Um, and had this law been around when he was in crisis, um, my uncle may still be alive today. Um, he was diagnosed with dementia, early onset dementia. He was suffering from dep depression. And he had easy access to a firearm, and nobody knew what to do to get the gun away from him. He was stubborn and nobody wanted to intervene, and the police said that they couldn't. So um, this law is very important to me and a lot of other people, and it will save lives. Um, so, um, you know, not only, as Steve said, were we the first in the nation, but to pass the Extreme Rest Protection Order now, 20 years later, we have the strongest law in the nation. So let's give a big round of applause for all the work that we've done. Um, we look forward. We look forward to working with all the partners in the room to trying to solve this and, and other gun violence um, issues. Um, we are proud to be here. We're honored to be here. And we look forward to working with everyone in this room to finally end the need to have these types of press conferences when we can finally say we've solved the gun violence problem. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, never underestimate. Uh, the power of committed moms. Um, one of the organizations that has been just a very powerful and successful voice for legislation to prevent gun violence um, is Moms Demand Action, and it's my pleasure to introduce someone who has been at the forefront of this issue at the national level, speaking out in Washington, as well as in our state, Alexis Gavanter of Moms Demand Action. Well, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for your commitment to gun violence prevention. Thank you, Andrew Woods, for having us here today. Um, I also want to represent uh, Representative Staffstrom and Gilcrest um, and all of the legislators who chose to put public safety first and work together to update our state's ERPO law and to direct Medicaid funding towards gun violence uh, intervention programs. And I want to thank the survivors and thousands of gun violence prevention advocates whose tireless commitment to bringing an end to gun violence makes days like today possible. And of course, I want to thank Governor Lamont, a governor who has made ensuring the health and safety of Connecticut residents remains a top priority is a champion of gun violence prevention measures and a good friend. As the former state chapter and legislative lead for Moms Demand Action, I can attest to the fact that when we work together, big change is possible. Change that saves lives and makes our communities safer. Today, we build upon other common sense change like a ban on ghost guns and 3D printed guns, uh, ban on bump stocks, adding safe storage requirements. But we also recognize that in spite of these tremendous efforts, um, gun violence continues to be a public health crisis, one only made worse by the pandemic. That is why our fight to pass common sense gun violence prevention policies will continue until all Connecticut communities are free from gun violence. Yes, this is a lofty goal, yet one which we must challenge ourselves to attain. And by listening to each other, finding common ground, and working together as we did this last session and so many before, 
uh, we get one step closer. So thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm really proud of this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexis Gavanter. It's now my pleasure to bring up State Representative Josh Hall. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Governor, good to see you today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here today. When uh, Andrew Woods brought uh, this issue to us uh, relative to Medicaid reimbursement, uh, myself, uh, Representative Gilchrist, Senator Murray, Speaker Ritter, Marina, because with the cancer, whether it's heart care, whether it's violence, youth building, Brother Lovejoy with the Blue Hill Civic Association, we know that when we put the resources in their hands, brother, the young people in our community, which was me about people that he's that. At odds with each other, wanting to end each other's lives, and they were able to build these relationships. And now, together, Governor, so this is one tool in the toolbox that uh, uh, about all their resources desperate to we're really big. Glad everyone's here today, but the work begins today. It uh, doesn't end today. And thank you for this afternoon. Thank you so much, Representative Hall. State Representative Jillian Gilchrist. Jillian. Good morning, everyone. To the survivors in the room, to the family members, to the frontline workers, and to the advocates, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your loss, I'm sorry for your grief, and I'm sorry for your trauma. But I also want to thank you so much for believing and for using the experiences you've had to try and change things for the better for others. And so we wouldn't be here today without the amazing work of you. We all know that gun violence, community-based gun violence, is preventable. And there are a variety of interventions that we can employ uh, to prevent that violence. And one of them is hospital-based violence intervention. And I've had the privilege of working with the Connecticut HBIP Collaborative to learn more about this work. And today I'm so proud, thank you, Governor, that this bill will be signed into law. And as my good colleague just said, this is the beginning. We need to get the funding, uh, the Medicaid funding. But this is a huge step because it legitimizes the work that these amazing men and women have been doing for years. They're on call 24-7. They show up at the hospital when someone has been shot. They provide this intervention in the ER waiting room to ensure uh, that there isn't retaliatory shootings in communities. And then they go even further and provide follow-up care in the community uh, to make sure that survivors of gun violence are getting the health care that they need. All while pretty much living with the trauma of having experienced gun violence day in and day out in their community. And so Andrew Wood, uh, the Javi, the amazing folks in Bridgeport and New Haven, all across this state doing this work, thank you. Uh, know that I am here, I'm not going anywhere, and I'm, I'm here to help. Um, thank you again, it's a big day, I'm so proud. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Representative Gilchrist. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of the Healthcare Alliance for Violence Intervention, Fatima Lauren Dreyer. Fatima. Thank you so much. Um, as, as Lieutenant Governor has shared, I am the Executive Director of the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention, a national network of hospital-based violence intervention programs, and it is such an honor to thank you, uh, Governor Lamont, for this historic day. 
Um, there's an incredible amount of leadership, Representative Gilchrist, um, um, House Speaker Matt Ritter, uh, Senator McCrory, uh, Representative Hall. Um, your work um, has really spearheaded something incredibly powerful for our nation, and uh, we're indebted to you. Andrew Woods, as an organizer and a fearless leader, uh, not only leading up Hartford's Community That Cares, but also the national, uh, uh, excuse me, the, the statewide collaboration. It's your work, your leadership has been instrumental to this moment. So thank all of you for this work. But this is for the frontline workers. Um, Representative Gilchrist, you shared so powerfully about this work. Um, the development of the hospital-based violence intervention model started in the 90s. And uh, frontline workers, people who are from the community, who have lived experience, who have the capacity to reach and touch patients who've been violently injured, who are traumatized and thinking about this impact on their lives, this workforce has been instrumental in addressing violence for decades, but has never been given the honor of really being seen as healthcare professionals. They've not been given the designation that they require to do their work and be, be thanked for it. So I want you all to join me in thanking frontline workers, not only in Connecticut, but across the country for their tireless work. We want more people coming uh, to this honorable profession and helping to address violence every day. In April, I had the honor of attending the White House Rose Garden Ceremony with Connecticut Senators uh, Rumenthal and Chris Murphy um, and heard the President declare violence as a public health emergency. Connecticut is leading the nation and moving us a step forward by leveraging public health resources to address this emergency. There are a number of people, researchers, who've, who've found that post-COVID in Connecticut, we saw a 61% increase in patients with violent injuries in our hospitals, our level one and level two trauma centers in Connecticut. COVID has had an incredible impact on violence. And this bill, allowing Medicaid to reimburse for violence prevention services, gives us that hope we need another tool in our toolbox to actually address the scourge of violence. So we're, we're in an incredible position. We also know that help is on the way. Uh, we are working together and lift up these examples nationally because we are fighting for a $5 billion commitment from the federal government to ensure that the resources that come to Connecticut can go straight to the ground and ensure that we can really transform communities. So I want you to join us in that fight, Governor Lamont. We want your voice at the federal level uh, to fight for this because we know cities like Hartford, cities like Bridgeport, cities like New Haven, and many more uh, need these incredible resources to do this work. Thank you again. Thank you. Fatima, thank you so much. It is now my privilege uh, to introduce Senator Doug McCrory. I heard somebody laughing. <laughs> I wasn't sure you were going to No, I'm good. Listen, I want to thank all the speakers who came before me. Uh, Representative Gilchrist, you were on it from day one. When Andrew came to me about this concept um, of connecting hospitals with the work that he's been doing, and let's be honest, you know, we've been doing this work in this community for a long time. And, and we could pass all the bills in the world. But we, this, 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 this issue is much deeper than just passing laws. We got to deal with some deep-rooted issues that have been going on in communities like Hartford and Bridgeport for such a long time, such a long time. They're so systemic. And being a senator in here and living in this community, it's hard, it's hard for me to be a resident to see what's going on in my city. It's tragic. But this is an opportunity. Like you said, another tool in the toolbox. But if we don't deal with some deep-rooted issues, I'll give you an example. When it's easier for a child in this community to get a gun as opposed to a fresh head of, head of lettuce, yep. come on now, you know what's going to happen. If we don't deal with poverty and redlining, mm -hmm. you can read every book in the world. They'll tell you this is not going to stop. But I'm glad that we have an opportunity with Andrew Smartest man in the world, his brother calls me at 7 o'clock in the morning. He knows how to reach me. 
right? He knows how to reach me. So uh, I just want to thank all the speakers, again, Representative Grilka, Josh, everybody. We still got a lot of work to do. We got to dig a little deeper. We got to think a little harder. We got to start reaching these children at the age of 10, 11, 12 years old and stop catching them once the problem is already in front of our faces. If we got to change policy when these kids are 15, 16, 17, we have lost the game. So I think that, again, working collectively and dealing with the root causes of what we are in will change things. Legislation is good. Resources are very important. Because this brother and others have been doing this work with no resources, crying out for help, crying out for help for years. Until those problems reach beyond our communities, you know what it looks like. But again, this is the opportunity. I don't want to be a Debbie Doubter. I don't want to be that, but I'm going to keep it 100 with you. Because we don't have an honest conversation. We're not going to change everything. And I'm glad to see everybody here today, but unfortunately under these circumstances. I want to see you come back today when we see 10, 11, 12 young brothers from this community going to college for free. When we change policies to give people opportunities who don't have opportunities and never had opportunities, will not get opportunities based on the education level and the opportunities that don't exist in our community. I want to come here and have that conversation. Okay, I'm done. Bye. Thank you. Senator McCrory, thank you so much for your advocacy, and we always have to wonder what you're thinking. Um, we are at a transformational uh, moment in terms of uh, federal funding, um, and we've just heard Senator McCrory and others reference federal funding, and yesterday when the governor announced that uh, our commissioner, Deidre Gifford, was giving up at least one of her full-time jobs, uh, as Acting Commissioner of Public Health um, in September, that she was going to be using some of her spare time as a top advisor to the governor on federal funding um, maximization for health care. So it is my great pleasure to introduce someone who's been a transformational uh, leader for our state, uh, my partner in government, Governor Ned Lamont. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to pick up right where uh, Senator McCrory left off. Um, you know, the people in this room make Connecticut leaders when it comes to doing everything we can to stem the scourge of gun violence. And as Doug said, you can do a lot by law. You can do a lot with resources. But we also have to change the heart. We have to know each and every one of these kids know we love them. We're going to stand there for them. We're going to give them the very best opportunity in life. And I think hope and opportunity uh, give us a running head start. And I want them to have a running head start in life. Yeah. A running head start in life. And, but you do what you can do. And uh, that's what some of these uh, laws are about. And that's what we're trying to say. Uh, by the way, Doug, you get a call. You call Andrew at 7 o'clock every morning. Uh, I get a call from Max Race saying, make sure you wear your orange tie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, you know the guy that got that call? Um, but, you know, it does symbolize that uh, Connecticut is and will continue to be a leader. And one of the things I'd love to see is um, Commissioner Ravello sitting next to Andrew right here and the mayor. And this is, this is what we have to do to work together. Is, you know, as James said, um, you know, going back a couple of years, um, we're going to do the best we can to make sure we have the very best, you know, on our streets, state police, increase the number of state police. We've added on additional classes. And on a personal note, I'm really proud that our, each of our uh, classes are the most diverse classes of state police we've ever had. More women, more people of color, folks from the community who work for the community, and what that says. It's so incredibly important. And, Andrew, we're there. I hope that... Uh, Law enforcement is there to do everything we can to prevent the violence and prevent the trauma and prevent the hospitalizations that um, you and the organizations you're involved with uh, step right up and um, what they have to do. Um, Steve and I were recently at a would-be shooting at a ball field in Bridgeport about a month ago, and it was uh, a bunch of kids uh, playing baseball. And uh, there were just some random shootings and uh, here are these uh, young kids lying belly down on the field, 
scared out of their wits. Um, and that's the type of cloud that violence, threat of violence, the sound of gunshots puts on a community and takes away that sense of uh, hope and take away that sense of opportunity. And we're working really hard when it comes to juveniles. There's a lot of talk about juveniles and cars and things. And uh, what um, Ames and I are trying to do is get involved early. Make sure that when something happens, we know it's just a first offense or a second offense. Make sure the judges have the information. Make sure they know that incarceration is not the answer, but help these kids get a, get a better chance. Help these kids get a better chance. Help these kids get a better chance. And, and, and Jeremy, what you said about, you know, the suicide really rung with me, that uh, twice as likely, and here we are in this, we thought we were on the backside of COVID. I hope we are. I think we are. Uh, we've seen what's going on in terms of addiction. We've seen what's going on in terms of suicide. We've seen what's going on in guns. What's going on? Every shelf is... Everybody's buying guns, bringing in guns. I mean, you're right. How, how can we keep people safe, themselves safe, the community safe? You can pick these things up like candy on a street corner. And, um, and we can't do this by ourselves. I mean, Connecticut's pretty, pretty good. We're, we're pretty good. But uh, we're just a small island. COVID, we found out we're a small island. Guns, we find out we're a small island. And um, whether it's Representative Gilchrist or... Jeremy, whoever said, you know, keep pushing. Keep pushing, uh, Senator Murphy. Keep pushing, Senator Blumenthal. We got Joe Biden in the White House. This is our time to do it. We show people what's worked in the state of Connecticut. Six lowest gun violence in the country. I think that's what you said, Jeremy. We can do this around the country. We'll all be much more effective if we do it together. And again, it starts with those kids. It starts with giving those kids the very best opportunity. That's uh, one of the things we've got in terms of the Medicaid support, Andrew. Make sure we get the additional resources you need. Make sure we can provide all the support, ongoing support you need to take care of these folks who are traumatized. Uh, we've done that in the state of Connecticut, I think, with some great help from our federal um, partners, you know, starting with the uh, biggest expansion of child care in the history of the state, adding on free child, free daycare, free um, summer learning camps. We still have a lot of capacity there. That's seventh, eighth grader, sixth grader. Get them over there. Get them there. Get them socializing with their friends. Get them there uh, getting back in the game, giving them good constructive alternatives uh, that they can do and make sure they're ready for school. And I want everybody back in school and do what we can. And finally, on that red flag law, it just reminded me, um, you know, when it comes to suicide, when it comes to all those emotional crimes, especially been augmented during this period of COVID. Um, we've got to take the lead. We've got to have our antennae system up. We've got to have folks in the community who can give us a heads up when there's something at risk, right, Fatima? Give us what we need to know so we know how to respond in the, according, in the appropriate way. And um, look, this is um, an amazing state. I'm proud that we're a state that's a leader on these issues, a leader when it comes to gun violence, what that means to the victims, what that means to the survivors, what that means to a community. And that's why we're passing these laws. They're going to stay at the front. Let's sign the bill. Thanks, everybody. All right, we're going to invite our speakers um, and advocates up, please, to join us. And uh, the governor is first signing the Medicaid bill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ebony, we're going to hold off on the second bill. Yep. Okay. Lieutenant Governor, that's the that's the. Um, this is the Medicaid bill. That's the Medicaid this bill. You, okay. Sir. All right. Okay. Thank you so All much. Right. Team, come on up. Executive members, come on up. Come on.